Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Anna Fielding. I'm an associate editor at Stylist Magazine. Uh, with me this evening, we have Rebecca Swift, uh, Charlotte Janssen, I'm trying to get everyone in the right order, Sue Uniman and <laughs> Stephanie Numani. Um, before we kick off, could you all just introduce yourselves very briefly? Uh, as Anna, Anna just said, my name's Rebecca and I'm a Creative Insights Director here at Get Images. I, uh, I'm Charlotte, I'm an editor at large at Elephant Magazine and I wrote a book on the female gaze called Girl on Girl. I'm Sue Uniman, I'm Chief Transformation Officer at uh, Mediacom, which is the largest media planning and buying agency, so I'm in the world of commercial and advertising, but I've also written a book called um, The Glass Wall Success Strategies for Women at Work and Business Who Mean Business, which is about gender equality at leadership le levels and um, <clears throat> therefore how women see women and how men see women I think is very crucial to that. And I'm Stephanie Namani. I am a visual artist and an essayist, and my work generally focuses on the importance of uh, working with women and creating content that's created with women for women. It's great. Um, so, as you're probably all aware, the further concept of the female gaze first sort of became popularized in uh, 1975 by a film critic called Laura Mulvey. Um, since then, it's been sort of taken away from just use in terms of film criticism and used to analyse everything from adverts to novels to all sorts of different texts. Obviously, this evening we're going to be narrowing in on photography, so I'd like to ask our panel and Stephanie as our working artist if we could kick off with you. What do you think female photographers bring to the visual language? Um, I, th I believe that it's... Um it, it, it was a disparity that became very obvious to me, like my first couple of years into photography. Um, one of the first photographers that I learned about, uh, because his work was the most prominent, was Terry Richardson. And being able to create and, and sort of like, m sort of measure um, his, the <coughs> content that he was putting into the photo uh, photography world and, and noticing how the objecti objectification of women was very much pronounced in his work and realizing the importance in creating work that sort of presents women um, with agency. Uh, and that's one of the reasons um, that amplified my, my commitment to self-portraiture, which was how I came into photography. And the more, and I never realized how important it was until people came to me and they're like, hey, I love how you present yourself and how you capture yourself. And, and the voice that it, it, it allows me to connect to and know that it's possible for me as a woman to be able to capture myself and tell my story with my own sort of, you know, my own visual language that makes sense to me and could possibly connect to somebody else and help them create their, their own narrative and tell their own stories. So I think it's important for female photographers to, to contribute sort of like a diverse lens through which to view different narratives that exist out there. So. And Charlotte, that sort of connects to something that you wrote about in the intro to your book in Girl on Girl, um, saying that you see that photography can be quite a dominant thing as a point and shoot. It's almost like an act of possession. Mm. Do you think that ties well, in? Well, that was it? kind of stolen from Susan Sontag, who I did recognise that, that, but I thought that. I'd give you the credit. <laughs> well, maybe I credit it. Oh, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think um, there's various things when you say about what female photographers bring to photography. Um, but I think, yeah, one of the things is the process and that, what Stephanie was just saying, like, I think the way that female photographers kind of actually create work is very distinct and different from how a male photographer might do it. Um, obviously, we're talking in broad generalisations, but from the 40 women I interviewed for my book, um, 39 of them, um, their subjects were either themselves or women they knew intimately. So either women that were their friends or acquaintances. Or, so there's already like a whole process and way of approaching what it means to actually photograph someone and own, like the ownership you have over their image. Um, that I think is really interesting. And whether you see it or not in the photograph, that's in the eye of the beholder. But for me, I think it does make a big difference. Um, Sarah, what's your take on that as someone who... who Sue, even? Sue, so, sorry, I was, I was thinking, who's Sarah? <laughs> I've had a very long day, and only two sips of that wine down there. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've conflated a Sue and a Rebecca yeah. like an idiot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll answer for Sarah. Okay. <laughs> so, Sarah is all of us. Oh, yeah, we're all Sarah. We are all Sarah. 51% um, uh, of the population are women. I think we all know that. That's well established. 80% of shopping decisions worldwide are made by women as a minimum. Less than 9% of 
of um, uh, uh, advert directors, people who film the adverts, direct the adverts, are women. Um, less than 3% of women running creative departments in UK advertising agencies. The, 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 the I don't know, just, how would you get there? How, how would you get there? How would you not accept that if you're trying to communicate with 51% of the population who have power over 80% of the money from a purely commercial route that it might be a nice idea to have some women at a senior level involved in some of the decision making. And so it's being very talked about in my industry at the moment. And there's a lot of path dependence. So I think, it, it, you know, that, that I've, I spoke as, as part of the research for my book to, to a woman photographer in the, in the commercial sector yeah. who said she's one of very, very few yeah. and um, uh, her work gets siloed. So, you know, there are certain bits of work. She, she gets a lot of offers to shoot food. You yeah. know, it's a... Food, how compelling. How compelling. And uh, it, th 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 there needs to be a proper change because we're operating in a world that feels actually very Victorian. Yes, yes. And that's an interesting point that you mentioned because when I was sort of processing the, the concept and the responsibility of the female gaze, it occurred to me that it's not something that's explicitly um, something that belongs to the photographer, it also belongs to the creative director or the art director, yeah. um, the pe people who contribute to the direction of the, the, the vision. Um, so it's not necessarily the photographer that uh, viewing through their own lens, they're following you know, a brief or something that's telling them this is the kind of content that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it begs the question, um, do they have to comply in order to essentially partake in this industry that's telling mm -hmm. them this is the story that we're looking for? Mm -hmm. uh, whatever it is that you even think you're about to contribute, just yeah. push that, just usher that yes. somewhere else. Yeah. So yeah. it's important to understand that, you know, that but responsibility is not explicitly the photographers, but also it's about the, power. the team. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely about power. And men have power over those images in the commercial sector. L literally, they just do. And there's no evidence that it, that that is a more effective way of, and common sense would say surely it's not the most effective way. Of it. I think it's five percent of commercial images are actually that we see, you know, day to day mm. around us are produced by women. That's yeah. a study that um, Anna Fox did. That's Anna Fox. That would sound so, about right. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Rebecca, as a creative director, what's your take on this? <clears throat> well, it's interesting. I mean, and I totally agree with everything that's been said here. Um, you know, working in the commercial sector and working in the industry that we work in, the, the amount of imagery that's being created every single day is, is you know, is, is massive. We create 63,000 images every day ourselves through mm -hmm. Get Images. Mm -hmm. And what I think we need to consider is if we bring more women into this industry and, and uh, allow more women to, to, to be involved in these big decisions is, is, is how the balance will change and, and how when, when we have more equity in terms of who's creating the imagery, we can have the conversations that we should be having about you know, which way is better. It's very difficult to have that conversation right now because there, there isn't the parity of male, male mm -hmm. contributors to, to female contributors. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, in terms of what the female photographer brings to, um, to the imagery, is, is the word that gets bandied around a lot in our industry, and that's authenticity. The number of brand guidelines or visual brand um, uh, guides that we get sent by our clients that have this word authenticity in it or, um, you know, real life. Um, and uh, you're laughing. You've done it, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, so have I. I think, probably, I think probably every single brand guideline that I see now has the word authenticity somewhere in it. Okay. Now, um, obviously, authenticity has been around... Um, something that looks real, um, that has real emotion, that has real interaction between human beings. The next iteration of that, the next evolution, is the people taking those photographs are the people who can re relate directly to the thing that they're taking. And whether that's uh, an ethnicity issue or a cultural issue or even you know, the, the, a gender issue, I think it's, it's kind of the next evolution of, of visual communication. What do the rest of you think that the next evolution of visual communication is going to represent? What, what do you think we're going to start seeing coming through? I, 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 th I think to build on what you're saying, um, and again, because I'm going to relate it to the stuff that I know about, 
we already still have a very polished um, set of advertising that's you know in every magazine and um, as you pass posters and watch TV, mm -hmm. um, cinema ads. What you see is you see someone's view of what people should look like. Mm -hmm. And on those rare occasions where people actually have shot real people doing something and there's ads that do do that, mm -hmm. you can instantly tell. I mean, like that. You don't need to be told. It doesn't need to be credited. You can instantly tell. Mm -hmm. And what I think is I think we're going to see a shift in the balance of, 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 of what's effective and what's not effective. So there will always be a role for the beautifully styled, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I think because there are so many, because everybody now is a photographer, so when I look back to when I was, so there's lots of photographs of me when I was a child. There are photographs of me when I, I, I was older, but as soon as I could run away from my parents' camera, there are no photographs of me at all. So unlike these days, there are, there's no photographs between I was 13, say 12, 13, to probably 28, 29. Um, and now we've seen a revolution in that, right? Because now there's more photographs of a, a, a young woman of, of that age mm. than, than possibly you know, at any other time. And because of that, I think we're therefore going to see the pendulum swift shift into authentic images being used way more everywhere and everybody having more of an eye. And that, you know, my guilty pleasure, and I'm not ashamed to admit it, is America's Next Top Model. Oh. And <laughs> Tyra I'm Banks, I'm with on that. <laughs> Next Level Fierce, told us, taught us all in last week's episode, spoiler alert, how to take a selfie. Yeah. And you know, I, my selfies are gonna get way better because of that. And I think, <laughs> obviously, professional photography is always going to be on another level. Mm. But I think, you know, everyday photography is, is, is going to be something that's more practiced and therefore more, effect, more compelling. I think it's interesting, and I think we should speak more about, about the sort of selfie culture and, and self-portraiture, which I'm using distinctly in general, but you used an interesting phrase earlier, so you said someone's view of what people should look like or would look like. Now, throughout history, women have always been generally the more visually represented in fine art and even religious art, um, and, and quite often in photography as well, and especially editorials. Um, do you think the disparity between being the looked at and being the looker. Where's the, where's the, the, the when do we start to match up? Where, if you're, how do I, how do I articulate I this? I think if you have yes. the opportunity to be the looker as much as you are the looked, then I think we're in a, we're in a good situation. Mm -hmm. I think when, when that balance is, 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 is wrong or, you know, out, out of kilter, then that's when it becomes an issue, I think. Um, and, and I kind of go back to my previous com my previous previous comment. It's very difficult to have this debate until we have that kind of sense of, of you know the female gaze versus the male gaze and the comparison of the two. Do they work commercially? Do they work in an, in an artistic way? Yeah. Um, right now, we're interested in it because it's new. You know, in, in the entire history of photography, it has been a male dominated pastime or a male-dominated yeah. vocation. So now we're bringing in, you know, all these wonderful young um, female photographers, of which Stephanie's one of them. Yeah. It's only when we start comparing like for like, the male looking at the male and the woman looking at the woman and the woman looking at the male and, you know, yeah. and, and that kind of cross-pollination that we really get a sense of, of you know, what's what. Yeah. And Charlotte, having studied women looking at women, <laughs> sorry, oh, sorry, oh, go on, no, no, sorry. I, I just wanted to expound on something that Rebecca said um, regarding having a balance sort of between being the looker and being one that's, what's it, looked, looked at, looked at. Yeah, looked at. And I sort of want to connect that to my project, um, The Black Victorian, where the concept initially was going to be a self-portrait project, and I realized soon on that it wouldn't translate, what I wanted to communicate would not translate as well. Because um, I kind of wanted to step out of, outside of myself and be able to, because when, when the idea occurred to me, it was sort of like an outsider looking in, um, looking for sort of like a representation um, that I, I felt was not adequate enough. And it required me to step outside of myself and be able to understand what concepts I can carry that appeal to my narrative and what concepts are way beyond me, where everyone needs to be able to look at it and say, OK, I can understand what what pushed her, or what drove her to want to bring this, this, you know, to fruition, basically. So, when you um, created that work, did you feel, did you feel that you were 
reappropriating history. I mean, not at all. I didn't. I, I felt like it wasn't a reappropriation because I, I, a lot of people who are familiar with Victorian era work, uh, especially with the paintings, there's a lot of uh, use of flowers mm. as, a, as a communication of a sort of abundance, essentially. And my approach to it, I wanted to use fruits, and I used orange peels, and that's just a personal touch because in my work, I just love to use citrus. Um, it reminds me of my grandmother, and it's just something that I just like to look at often. So I try to incorporate it as much as possible in anything I'm anything I'm creating. I have more pictures pictures of oranges than the average person. Okay, <laughs> uh, let's just put it that way. So for me, it wasn't a, necessarily a reappropriation. It was a reimagining. Then it was a reappropriation. Mm -hmm. and I made it my own by um, borrowing aspects of like painting techniques as well as just pairing it with photography and just. Um, a lot of people don't know that photography was born in the Victorian era, and I thought it was interesting the stylistics of photography that was present, especially with like black narratives. It was very um, lackluster. It was just, <laughs> you know, I just wanted to bring that sort of energy that I would have wanted to see. So it was a reimagining more than a reappropriation. I yeah, think. and I think the exciting thing for us when we saw Stephanie's work was that we see, as I, as I said, thousands and thousands of images every single day, mm. and um, and it was it was taking those you know taking the genre of portraiture and taking you know the historical element and then mashing it with another culture was was really exciting to us and and I think that's again where we can see some we'll hopefully see some some changes in terms of how photography looks. Sorry, Sue. So you had well, no, I was, it's something you said, Anna, which just made me think, which is that there is a theory that. Um, the reason that we ha we we democracy the roots of democracy started was when mirrors got good. So mm. before mirrors were good, you could only look at yourself in a lake, mm. and you couldn't really see what that you were different or or an in individuality, and therefore, if you like, the roots of people saying, "I I, I want to be represented as as in, as individual and as separate rather than just a part of an overall status." Mm. Are linked to the invention of good mirrors, um, and what we've got now is women taking ownership of, of images, and it seems to me that that's possibly an essential in, in, in a change again in, in power structures. And I've got a very slightly political thing to say, which maybe I shouldn't say, but say I'm, 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 I'm well, I'm struck by the fact that when women cover their faces, it's often in places where they also don't vote. <clears throat> so although that takes us into the realm of religion that I feel very nervous about going into, mm. it's also linked to not having necessarily a chance to vote for a government. Um, so there's something very profound about imagery and power mm. and independence and individuality, I think. In terms of representation, particularly from younger women, um, you know, people can be quite disparaging and, and you, know, you can even hear the inverted commas when people say selfie culture and it's, it's dismissed, I think, because it often codes very young and it codes very female. Um, people will dismiss it as, as shallow and frivolous. Um, do we do you like agree with that? that? Yeah. <laughs> when, um, I'm, I'm sort of a, a purist in where when selfie, the term selfie came out, I'm like, and people would address my self-portrait as because initially it was self-portrait, and then when selfie became like the culture, and people, oh, selfie, I'm like, it's not a selfie. <laughs> it's just not a selfie. It, it, it takes more, you know, more yeah. thought, more work, more sweat, more art, than, more, art <laughs> more passion than um, selfie. But I think as selfie culture has evolved, it took me a long time before I took a selfie, and even now I'm, I'm terrible at selfies. <laughs> like, I just look at it, I'm like, what is this? It's just, it's just always so awkward to me. I look at the, just the, the, the glare in my eyes, it's just, I'm like, who is this person? I don't recognize her. But it's, it's, there's a sort of like, you, you wanna, when, when, when something is uh, revolutionary in, in a sense, and that's mm. what selfie culture mm. is, especially with how you attach it mm. to the mirror, because photography in a sense is a mirror. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's this, People want to resist it. You want to resist something because it's new, and you're like, what is this? I don't, I don't want to understand this culture. It's young, oh, it's for the younger generation. Those people on their phones, they want to put down, you know, they always want to take pictures. You want to separate from it. But I, I think there's a, a power and a necessity, sort of, uh, in, in, in the role, as well as the, some dark to it, of course, with everything. There's, there's good and there's the dark. 
Um, but for the most part, I like to pour into, as well as celebrate those who find a sort of like empowerment and being able to look at themselves. Mm. Um, I know some close friends who, you know, go through dark times and part of that, uh, um, that, that, that moment, being in that sort of darkness is not wanting to look at themselves. Mm -hmm. So part of their healing comes with being comfortable with that image, whether it's looking in the, mir in the mirror or taking a picture of themselves and saying, I feel good, I look good today, I'm gonna share this. You know what I'm saying? There's like an empowering thing, it's an empowering energy that, that follows selfie mm -hmm. culture that I think is, is worth celebrating. And, and yeah. Charlotte, I saw a nod just back there. Yeah, it's just something, I think having spoken to so many um, you know, younger photographers who've, some of them, you know, also take selfies and that is their art which I think is okay that can, can be art as well yeah. um, have told me similar sort of stories about that and I think there's something quite um, you know I'm also not a selfie taker but I, I do think that there's a therapeutic or cathartic kind of element to them and, and I think that a lot of the kind of disparaging comments that you mentioned that um, young photographers do frequently get even when they do the kind of work that Stephanie does which is which is very different um, is that it's narcissistic, it's vapid, um, and that's kind of just the embedded misogyny again that's just showing its head, you know, every time a woman does anything with her body. It's kind of the most difficult position to be in, to be a photographer and want to photograph yourself or other women, because that's the thing that's considered, you know, that's been done through, like you said, through the whole of our history, and is already, there's a very established idea of what that means to do that, and it's always a political act. Mm. So I think, Coming back to what you said about the future, it would be what I personally like to see and what I find interesting is when the body actually is used but kind of takes more of a, is not the focus of the image. So if we could get to a place where we look at a picture of a woman and don't say, oh, that's a picture of a woman, it's just we, we see it and we think it's a picture of a person. Mm -hmm. And we don't just see that as like, oh, this is feminist and this is, she wants to talk about beauty ideals and, you know, it's not. Like when we can get to that point, that will be. And, and some photographers starting to do that, you know, I also see that in Stephanie's work, that it's not all about the body, it's just what can you do with this form, mm -hmm. this thing, and make people look beyond that. So yeah. it's an interesting point to go from, of kind of like taking it onto the next thing and not seeing a woman as, as an object, but as part of an image. Mm -hmm. um, Rebecca, who do you think at the moment, so this is a very tough one to land you with quickly, but um, who do you think at the moment is really, which female photographers do you think are really pushing the boundaries in the way that Charlotte described? Well, you just have to look around in this gallery, actually. I so. thought you'd set me up for that one, <laughs> 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 Stephanie's work. Um, I mean, for me, the, the ones that really excite me are the ones who are taking on technical challenges or taking on um, life challenges and, and creating amazing imagery and, and I really like Vaseline's work who's, who's behind you here and this is with the flowers with on the, the flowers here. again actually is what Stephanie was saying <laughs> and the reason I like her work is and, and you don't necessarily get that through the images is that she lives in a god-awful place in Siberia oh, wow. middle of nowhere and she creates this imagery with her friends at home. Um, she creates a kind of studio environment and she uh, buys um, Western Vogues and, you know, and all the rest of it um, and, and, and is creating amazing imagery. And I think, again, the history of photography is around the, 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 the kind of the men that have developed great techniques or have discovered a new way of shooting and have you know found a new way to catch a light and you know we've got Margaret Bork White in the in this exhibition who was a, a, a gentleman I'm pointing around there because she's around there um, <laughs> and she was a, a, a you know obviously a, a photojournalist and and what most people well, most people know she was the first female photojournalist in the US, but what most people don't know is she developed a technique to be able to shoot in steel factories so that she could um, uh, get the you know the amazing you know the, the the, the heat and, and the flames and everything um, and through using you know different lights and that actually I find really exciting it's almost like taking that very geeky male style of photography and, and kind of you know, adopting it and, um, and and creating something amazing with it so I'm going to be very diplomatic and say everybody in this room <laughs> <Good answer. laughs> Um, moving on slightly, as your mention of Vogue actually it reminded me of a conversation we all had previously, and, and Sue, you, your point, I think you alluded to it earlier um, as well, that, you know, 
We have all of these wonderful art photographs or editorial photographs, but actually the imagery we see much more frequently every day is the day-to-day -day advertising imagery mm. on the tube, on our phones, on the television, mm. In, mm. in magazines. Yeah. And sometimes, although we've all seen the reams of brand guidelines, um, sometimes it seems that that's chosen with less care and has less art behind it. As a media booker, what, what would you say? Um, well, I mean, I, 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 I'm a, I, d I don't commission I, I'm images sorry, I know, for an agency media who does media that. <laughs> But, um, I mean, two things. First of all, I think we were talking about it on the phone, which was, I can remember years and years ago, where there was a particular image of a front cover of Vogue that, where, the, where the woman on the front cover had very few clothes on. And it was at a time when I was particularly annoyed about page three. And I realised, my goodness, this woman has no more clothes than that woman. But this woman, the woman in, in the newspaper with no clothes on, was simpering at the camera. And the woman on the front cover of Vogue was glaring at uh, the audience, mm. and I found that really interesting. That so much of it was about the actually about the eyes and the expression in the eyes. Um, but um, uh, you know, the other thing we talked about was there's a, a big campaign um, run by the fantastically named Madonna Badger, who runs a creative agency in New York called um, Women Not, Not Objects, mm. and she's done a lot of work going out and asking kids what they think about the kinds of images that appear on posters, billboards in Times Square and, and around America. And again, has started a whole campaign pointing out to advertisers and to people who are commissioning work in creative agencies that there is a level of respect that, as children, we expect of the um, imagery of women, but isn't always delivered by advertising. Mm. Um, and the ASA report from last year, so the Advertising Standards Authority, again, has come out and said very clearly there need to be more guidelines because we are, this is the culture that we're bringing our children up in and it's not as it should be. And Charlotte, as a visual critic, what do you think of the sort of everyday images you see in the mass media? Yeah, I think it's pretty crap because I think. Like, <laughs> no, 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 say what you think. Yeah. <laughs> I think also even you know some of the magazines like Vogue that are you know will run all these editorials about diversity and you know um, even today I was reading like the Evening Standard magazine's Men edition and um, you know but there's still all these like little sexist things in there like oh do you want to have a body like Harry's engaged what's his the fiance oh, Megan. Yeah. Megan you know like little things like that it's like the one one side you're <clears throat> suggesting you know we need to have this revolution and all but then you'll at the same time you'll go through a magazine and see the ads I think um, you know like Elle magazine I, I was flicking through the other day in the first sort of 10 pages just you know count how many blonde blue-eyed um, women you get to before you get to any writing or anything and it's it's still and they, they're like you know one of the more feminist kind of magazines I think in terms of their content so it's the same like if you sit on the tube or you start to notice it like you go into a news agent you see what the front covers are you go um, look at the ads that you see um, on buses or everywhere once you start to notice it you realize how how biased it is and, and that's really that, that does affect us, I think, because it's subliminally or like subconsciously like, every day you're seeing that. Mm. Um, so we don't get these kind of myths about women from nowhere. It's I mean, are we slightly people. complicit? And I use we in the broadest, broadest sense, not just the five of us sitting here on chairs, because mm. as it was pointed out when we spoke before, um, people do buy things off yep. the back of this imagery, and that's mm -hmm. probably one of the reasons it persists, because there's a commercial validation of it as well. And I'll put that back to you as an editor of a, of a fabulous <laughs> magazine. Damn, I was thinking I'd done that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! But, I mean, you obviously have a good sense of what, you know, how, when your circulation is up or, you know, when, when, I mean, I, getting hold of stylists is an absolute nightmare. Can you just make more, please? Because I, I can never get, unless, if you get to the train station at, at any time after nine, you can't, you can't get a copy. But anyway. We would um, love to print more, yeah. that's down to the cost of paper. But do you have a sense of, you know, what works better? I mean, Actually, what we have found <clears throat> works better, um, especially for our audience who are, uh, stylist is distributed free, for those of you who don't know the magazine, um, uh, in urban centres, and most of our readers are working women who live or work in the centre of cities across Britain. So it does sort of self-select an audience particularly. We have found, actually, 
that the more we have pushed to be more diverse in every way, uh, not just in terms of skin colour, but in terms of age, you know, we had Lauren Hutton on the cover of our last mm-hmm. fashion issue. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got Oprah Winfrey and Ava DuVernay and Mindy Kaling on the cover of next week as issue. Um, we have found that from our readers, especially people who don't see themselves represented so often, it wins you a lot of very strong fans very quickly. And I think um, for us, it's just so heartening to see that what we've sort of consciously tried to push for and tried to do has such an immediate pickup with but, the audience. But, but that's the point. It's, it's senior women in decision-making processes. Mm. Right? And we're a very that's female-dominated That's what we haven't staff. had up till now. Yeah. Mm. We mm. haven't had women going, maybe we'll try this. We've, be, we've had um, men leading companies and saying, no, we carry on doing it like this. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm very commercial. I'm not, I'm not in the world of art. I'm in the word, world of commerciality. Yeah. But... There are, there's lots and lots of just path dependence. Mm. Doesn't mean to say that other ways won't work. And, and you know, I, I, I know your CEO and she's fabulous. And, she's a lovely um, woman, yes. Yes, she <laughs> is. And, and I think it's, it's no coincidence that you're getting to make those kinds of decisions and experiments when you've got that kind of leadership. Mm. Um, it is, uh, yeah, we have a female CEO, we have a female editor-in-chief, we have a female editor. Interestingly, our photo director and our art director are both men, but they're very nice. So. <laughs> it's allowed. <laughs> um, so, in terms of, I mean, obviously we have Stephanie, um, and there is everyone in the exhibition, but whose work do you really love? Who do you find, who are you really enthusiastic about as female photographers working today? Stephanie, of your peers, is there anyone that... Yeah, there's um, Jasmine Durrell. She's uh, based mm. in, um, she's from Detroit, but she's based in LA. She does phenomenal work with mostly uh, women subjects. And there's uh, Tony Goon. She's a South African artist. She's also into self-portraiture. Um, oh, who else can I think of? There's Christina. She's right there. She's phenomenal. Sorry to put you on the spot, but you're great. And, and you're uh, holding a camera. <laughs> she's just wonderful. Right has a camera. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chrissy. Um, yeah, it's it's really refreshing to have to see that that energy just. It's very hard to name any. It's very hard to name more than two famous female photographers. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. When when you start asking around, you say name a female. Yeah. Name a female f- famous yeah. advertising photographer. Yeah. yeah. It's always Annie Leibovitz. Yeah. It's always you ask anyone anywhere in the world. It's always Annie Leibovitz. Maybe Ellen Bonnenworth a bit. But there aren't. We still haven't pushed women no. up to yeah, that. That's very true. In, into that kind of hallow ground where. I expect the cameras are too heavy for the <laughs> ladies. Is that what it is? Maybe. <laughs> you know. We have heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was, that was a joke. That was. A, no, that was a joke. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I should no. That was a, That was a, it, was, it was supposed to be so obviously yeah. a joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> Stop, but you, stop you the jokes next to self. Yeah. We would like yeah. to clarify on behalf no, of Getty Images, that was yeah. very much a joke. <laughs> Actually, there is... Oh, really? Yeah. It's not a joke? No. no. I'm sorry. I'd be surprised if, if that's If that's, that's actually, actually permeating. Yeah, okay. It's too soon for humour. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Charlotte, is there anyone whose work that you're particularly an admirer of? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the 40 in the book that are all um, working now, like, very actively. But I like, I really like, um, at the moment, Keezua, who's from Angola. Mm-hmm. Um, she's working in Luanda and she's done some amazing projects about disability and female genital mutilation, things, feminism in Angola. Um, from um, London, I really like Juno Calypso, who's got a show mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. Melbourne at the moment. Um, and Maisie Cousins as well. They're both great, like just doing interesting things with photography in general, I think, you know, not just female gaze. Do you know if they get any commercial work, or is it all art? Yeah, they do. They, they do. do some, mm. yeah. Because mm. that's an interesting point, actually, because mentioning both Ellen and Ellen Van Unworth and Andy Leibovitz as an mm. example of commercial photographers, obviously, mm. I know them best for their editorial work, mm. and there's such a crossover. It's a, it's, there's a real cross-pollination in terms of creators. Mm. Where do you think someone... How often, which way round does it normally go? Do people come up through commercial and jump into editorial, or does it go the other way? I, I think it's through commercial. I think that's the easiest way to get your foot through, through the door <laughs> for you know, people who are willing to compromise certain uh, commitments they might have to their artistic integrity, as long as it gets their foot in there and then mm. they feel comfortable enough mm. to unfold and fully show this is, this is what I'm capable of and this is the kind of narrative that I want to push forward. I think commercial, because for me, when I started, I was. Um, when I was still getting my, my feet wet, so to speak, 
I got into um, live performance photography and I got to work with some amazing artists. And it wasn't long before I was like, um, yeah, this is not it. <laughs> and, and I was willing to stick it out, it didn't matter how long it, it, it would take. I was like, I want to get in the way that I want to. Um, my integrity means more to me than anything. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's important to me to walk through and, and with my shoulder high knowing that I got there how I wanted to get there. And I, as much as I was doing so well, you know, my name was coming up. I was like, eh, this is not it. I'm not. Mm. And I just quietly stepped back and removed that. People don't even remember that I did live performance photography at some point. I'd like to see some of that. I work with uh, Kendrick Lamar and um, Oh my God, Kennedy my daughter and, would be so Yeah, it was, it was good times. It was before he blew up. So it was oh, like right. kind of like a major thing. Because you know, mm -hmm. when he blew up, you're like, oh, you work with Kendrick. I was yeah. Like, Shh, shut up. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. But it's, it's, yeah, it's important to know where your commitments lie. For me, I have to just, I can't, I can't sacrifice. I can't compromise. I can't yeah. shrink. Yeah. I have to come in as me fully. Just, oh, yeah. so inspirational. It is, yeah. 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 <laughs> Your mention of live photography interests me actually because we've talked quite a bit about um, women representing women and um, Charlotte you touched on reportage as well. What we haven't really talked about is female landscape photographers, female food photographers, still mm, lifes mm. And, and live photography, sports photography, all sorts of things. You know, how do you feel the representation is in, in all the other fields where people are creating images? I cannot name a single female landscape photographer, I'm very ashamed mm. to say. I, and working on food shoots, the women tend to be the stylists rather than the photographers. Mm. So I think that obviously the skill's more in the styling than, mm. than the photography. It's but insanely difficult food photography is, from what yeah. I've seen. Yeah. So I don't know if the others have any. Do you have any, any examples? Of names? Of food or, and... I, I mean, or, or, yeah. or do you think, it, do you think the, 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 mm. the being of the female gender Bring something to the other disciplines as well. This is a curveball Does question. Does it bring something? Do you, do you think yeah, so? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the female gaze, like as I understand it, could apply to anything, not just mm. the female yeah, body. So that's what I thought. you could have a female gaze on the landscape, or a that, female gaze mm. on football, or I don't know, whatever it is. Mm. Um, it's 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 about like a different way of seeing the world that's different to what we've already seen, and it isn't only counter to um, the male gaze, but it's just a different something different, you know, more. I don't know, for me, something that perhaps is more fluid or, and, you know, less fixed about ideas of, of identity, things like And that could apply to anything, to architecture, to anything around mm. us. But also, it shouldn't have to be different for there to be 50% representation yeah. of them as well. Mm. So it, 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 it certainly may be, but it, it, again, it's extraordinary that it's such a closed mm. shop. Why do you think that is? I think it's, and, and it, it, I found it fascinating that, and, and this is what Anna said about, you know, we, we, we keep buying stuff, and so marketeers and brand managers mm. keep creating imagery in the same way. Mm. And because we have had more male mm -hmm. photographers in history yeah. um, that have created a certain type of imagery, the other photographers that emulate them, which also tend to be male, are, are then hired, and so. But you get that kind of goes for the images of women. It, that no, feels I'm talking like a about logic, anything. I'm talking about images landscapes, of, cars. of a tree. It, it feels as though, yeah. It, it's, but isn't it just like everything? Everything is like it's for men first, and then women have come in later. So it's we're catching up. Is those a gender imbalance? But, but it sounds like there's more women in law, in even even in banking. Than there are. It seems very, it's very tiny. It's not no, 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 yeah. no, no. But in most businesses, um, women are only in a minority in the boardroom now because they're coming out of university usually with better qualifications than boys, um, and they're getting, they're going in as grad intake, and, and there are many businesses again like retailers that have a vast um, wealth of women in work. And yet, it seems in this area, in terms, at any working level, there aren't the women. I have a theory, um, and I think it's partly because so many of the creative, in so many of the creative industries are so financially precarious, and um, there's no clear corporate structure that you can move through. There's no idea. You always have to constantly hustle for work for yeah. a lot of things. Um, even if you do get a permanent job one day, then another day the wheel can spin and you're back to freelancing yeah. again. 
So I think perhaps that unless you're from an already privileged background in whatever way that privilege comes from, mm. it, the less privilege you have, the harder it is to mm. take on unstable work would be... Okay. I don't so know, it's, it's a theory I've just come up with. But and, I yet, think and yet if yeah. you go to universities and colleges, which I'm very privileged to be able to do, the <coughs> women outnumber men on photography courses. Yeah. So yeah, something happens sense. when they leave university Maybe they start, you know, get the first job, but when you start going up the ladder and being the decision makers and, you know, uh, commissioning shoots and things, um, something changes. And that, you know, we're doing research into that at the moment, trying to understand what happens to these young photographers. Because it feels like it must be cultural to me, as in it must be culturally unwelcoming at scale. And um, I think the agencies as well are not employing women, because I think it's something like 8% of commercial agencies have women, like it's 8% of women right. on their books. Mm. So the agencies obviously aren't hiring, or maybe you know the women aren't even getting as far as going mm. for the, mm. the jobs in the first yeah. place, because oh, whatever. I'd like to add to that point a bit about women. It's, I think it's partly um, not just knowing that the resources are available, like the availability of, of resources to actually seek out going into an agency and trying to build a career around um, you know, being a photographer or, mm. or a visual artist in general. Um, I think some women sort of suffer under the delusion that that accessibility is not there for them. And then there's also the idea that it's really not there for them. Mm. So it's, if, it, if they feel like it's accessible, I think more women um, would feel more comfortable um, moving from uh, just being a practicing visual artist and independent mm. visual artist, actually seeking out agencies and and wanting to build up, you know, move up forward. At least I can say that's what it was for me and my my personal experience. And knowing that there's there's a way up. You don't have you don't necessarily yeah. have to remain uh, just independent. You can seek out agencies, and they are there to you know assist you in your journey. It's not mm. you know it doesn't necessarily compromise anything that you may feel you know that it does. Yeah. I think that's actually the good thing about Instagram and Tumblr and things like that because now, and I think that's why you see a lot more women using those platforms mm -hmm. perhaps mm -hmm. because you can actually, like you say, it's about agency and you can build, you can have your own agency yeah. now, you can have that's your right. own following like a lot of the major photographers like Petra Collins of like our time now, um, you know, started out on Instagram and just built a huge mm. following so, mm. and then other people became interested. Very true, in, yeah. so. Do you think there's an element of age as well, as in all those young women on courses, they haven't graduated yet, mm -hmm. and I mean, obviously there may well be a dropout rate, but at the same time, there are probably a lot of people who were, have been working for 30 years, mm -hmm. and that, that would skew the gender balance as things are changing, but it's going to take a while for that to filter yeah, through. Yeah, so it's going to be a good 30 years until, until that new generation comes through. Yeah. See, that's such a look of disappointment on your face for that 30 years. <laughs> oh, because I've, I'm just, you're reminding me of something that Baroness Helena Kennedy, the civil rights lawyer, wrote our uh, foreword. For the I book. like the comparison, I must say. And, <laughs> and she said to me, she said, all my career, Sue, they have been saying to me, it'll be fine, the women are coming through, the women are coming through. And she said, they are not coming through. Mm. And she was talking about in senior leadership. Mm. And I just think... It feels wrong to be going, it'll be all right mm -hmm. in 30 years' time, because... People need to die quicker. Mm -hmm. People need to die quicker. <laughs> I, I have a question for you. To oh. end on something slightly <laughs> more uplifting. <laughs> real quick, Sorry, I have a question definitely. regarding, like, in your experience with, um, in the commercial world, how frequently... Because um, it's, it's not necessarily, like, the, the photographer is seeking out the agency. Is, is there the agency seeking out the photographer, like more women photographers and, and essentially looking to give them a platform to sort of push that forward. Because it's not explicitly on the side of the photographer, you know what I'm saying? Like the agency also plays a role in yeah, they do, seeking do, them no, out. Uh, abs how, how absolutely. I, I, so I don't work at a creative agency who are okay. the people who largely do most of the creation of the images. I work okay. at a media agency. Okay. We do sometimes create images but it will be more like uh, an Instagram or a, or a social media campaign. I see. Um, and I think this is where the point about creative directors and creative agencies, who are the people who are commissioning, mm. being predominant 97% men, mm. kind of comes in because mm. there's just no, not enough change. And you know, yeah, they're selling products and they're winning awards mm. and awards being awarded by other men creative directors. <laughs> um, and, and it's all good, it's all good. But, 
just, it's just, <laughs> it's, I don't think that's going to sort itself out mm. either. I think it mm. needs, um, we need to be more vocal in our mm. um, feelings about change. Yeah. And I, don't, you know, I don't think it's about consumers. I don't think a consumer <laughs> is going to go, no, is that, was that, was that ad shot by a, ma a man or a woman? Yeah. But as a, as a business thing, why wouldn't you want diversity of opinion? I mean, if I know one thing from my experience uh, at a very successful media agency, is we are that way because we happen to have a very uh, diverse mix of people mm. running the company. Yeah. Um, diversity is the thing that works. It just so happens that gender is a shortcut to that because it's so much one way rather than the other. Um, so leading on, so we end on a slightly positive note before we open it up to you, so do think of questions. But what do you think we should do to make change? How can we make change? What are we going to do? I think from my point of view and for, for, for people like myself and Sue who are in a, you know, in, in a strong position and, and in a powerful position is to, is, to, is to actually actively seek out female photographers and actively seek out mm -hmm women and bring them, bring them into the fold almost, bring them into the community and, and, and create an environment where um, it's, a good, you know, it's a good place to be and, uh, and, and allow them to be successful in, in, in the industry. Yeah. <clears throat> Charlotte? Yeah, I agree. I think supporting um, you know, women doing anything really is, um, is something like Elephant Magazine we, we're really into, mm. we're really strong. Um, female-led team as well and I think um, also just encouraging sort of more nuanced discussions around the things that women do so that it's not um, pigeonholed always into the tokenistic we need a female artist or we need a feminist artist or we need you know that is a genuine like authentic um, thing just because we're not badging it up as a diversity initiative it's just what we do mm. yeah, yeah mm. I agree yeah. with that completely. because as, as you said it's kind of it, you know, it's beneficial for everyone and it's a natural thing to do, yeah. especially now. I, I agree with that and, and not to sort of poke at the premise of this event, but I think it's important for it to be a year-round thing and not waiting for sort of like months and holidays that are, yeah, that are reserved yeah. for marginalized groups, whether it's, you know, women or, you know, black people, yeah. POC, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to, for agencies to communicate that all year round as opposed to just waiting conveniently to use it as a strategy and a marketing ploy and like, hey, hey, I know it's your day. Um yeah, yeah, yeah. for you. Um, um, and that's it. You know, it's April. Shut up. We're done. See you, <laughs> you next year. Yeah. See, ya. <laughs> See you next year. You know, I think it's important for you know more agencies to, to definitely like make that a steady, consistent voice as opposed to just for opportunistic events to do that. And so because of tonight, um, I'm going to ask the question. So we do have um, a creative division called Mediacom Beyond Advertising, and I'm going to ask them um, to look for uh, if, they're, if, if they're casting photographers, if they're casting directors, for them to have a 50-50 shortlist. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not going to tell them they've got to have every other mm -hmm. photograph taken by a woman, but I'm going to ask them to consider having a 50-50 shortlist, because why on earth wouldn't they? Mm. That is very strong actual change and a yeah. lovely point yeah. to it, so thank yeah. you for everybody.